Hi, I'm Michael Gwent, CEO of MRG Labs, which is a 501c3 lab focused on STEM education, community innovation, and workforce development, primarily using FDM 3D printers, among other fun toys. I'm both a scientist and an engineer by education and advanced manufacturing subject matter expert. For over a decade, I've been using 3D printing to solve problems around the world. The lab has been running a farm of 3D printers for quite some time, currently with a big fleet of Lulzbot TAS 6s, a few Lulzbot TAS workhorses, and a slew of Creality CR10S Pro V2 printers, among all the other supporting equipment. I've been on the hunt for some new machines and wanted to try out the Sindavaraxi printers that came out last year. So I got a few of those in to use on the lab. I get asked often what's the difference about all my different machines, so I thought I'd do a review on two of my favorites, the Lulzbot TAS Workhorse and the Sindavaraxi, to show you how remarkable both of them are and some of the key differences. When I initially compared the two printers specs online, I found the Sindiver actually had several different and unique features, such as the touchscreen display, the tool head, the 25 point mesh bed leveling, and the filament runout sensor. And plus it has a magnetic flexible print bed. These new features alone were enough to convince me to purchase the Sindiver Axie. Once I used it for a few weeks to learn enough about it to give it a fair unbiased comparison, I ran some side-by-side -side comparisons to see how the printers match up. With that said, here's what we'll be looking at all through the course of this fun but long print day. Printer setup, printer designs and features, sample print comparisons, and lastly overall key differences. Printer setup. These two printers are based on a similar open source design and have a similar design aesthetic features. However, beyond the obvious color scheme differences, there are several notable differences between the printers. Although the setup is fairly similar with a few notable differences, let me take you through them in these videos. The setup for both of these are virtually the same and involves unboxing and laying out all the parts on a table, followed by pulling the wires out of the way as to not mess up the end connectors. Now you unscrew the four bolts on the bottom that typically hold the bed down. The TAS workhorse comes with these flexible little strips that make it to where you don't lose the screws, but in reality, they're more of a pain than what they're worth, so I typically remove them and store them in the toolkit. The easiest way to not lose them when you have it apart is to just simply put them back in the printer. From there, we screw down the bed and all four points with the motor in the back of the machine, and then connect the two wires in the back of the bed, one to the motor and one to the other in stop sensor. Next, you connect the three connectors to the left side of the bed, and then screw in the bracket to the side. Pulling the Allen wrench through the top of the bracket to access the head of the bolt. Be sure to push the harness up towards the bed if it's down so that way when the bed moves along the wires don't get caught on the frame. Following that you can plug it in and begin doing your initial calibrations. Note, based on experience the power supply switches automatically so these printers can both be used in 110 and 220 volt applications depending where you are in the world. The setup of the Axie is almost virtually identical, but a little bit easier because the bolts on the screws that hold down the bed have a broader head on them, which makes them easier to do by hand. Additionally, the Axie does not have those flexible straps, so just be sure to put the bolts back in the frame when the bed isn't attached. Next on the startup, now that we have given you a rundown on the differences between the features of the printers, I would like to continue pointing out the differences during startup of the printers. When you turn on the axis, the Z-axis moves to the top of the print area, and the tool head goes to a ready position. The workhorse runs a nearly identical process upon powering on, although it does have a different tool head, ready position. The workhorse uses the sequence to level the X-axis, as I mentioned previously, and unfortunately leaves it in a potentially not so level position relative to the bed. At this point, you can access options on either printer from the menus. If you aren't printing directly from the computer, which is possible on both printers, although I don't recommend it, you can select the model you want to print from the list, either from the USB drive on the Axie or from the SD card on the workhorse. As a point of comparison, not all computers have an SD card reader anymore and may require a separate adapter as mentioned previously, whereas most computers have a USB slot. You can still use an SD card on the Axie, I found out, though, if you use a direct USB to SD adapter. Similarly, not shown in the video, but I've been worried about snagging the USB drive 
and either breaking the drive or the port. Not a great solution, but I ordered a six inch USB extender so I could just flop it over the side and reduce the wear and tear of inserting and removing the drive from the top so often. Only word of caution on this is to absolutely make sure it isn't anywhere near going into the printing area or may get caught up in a mechanically moving part, which could be catastrophic. If this is the case, Velcro it down onto a flat surface somewhere on the side or the front. With respect to the screens, I found that the touchscreen was much easier to use and select the files I want to print. Once a print is started, each printer will auto home and then set and wait for the temperatures to be reached and the final wiping of the nozzle. As mentioned previously, however, the workhorse forces the four corner leveling prior to each print. I found this annoying because every time I want to just simply start a print or restart a print job, I have to wait for it to go through the sequence. With the Axie, you already have the mesh bed level compensation stored and it will use that automatically. You may want to do an X level, X axis level however, you would only need to do that after turning the printer on and off, not for every print necessarily. The startup speeds of both of these are relatively similar, although the bed on the workhorse did heat up much faster than the Axie. The workhorse can't handle the higher resolution though, as you'll find since it's got a bigger nozzle at 0.5 millimeters but therefore it can print a little quicker. Once you take these into account with the time savings and the leveling of the workhorse, the overall time is about 20% faster on the workhorse than Axie on average, albeit you will sometimes not have successful prints if you're going for higher resolution. The Axie, as you can see, can achieve some higher resolution prints because it has a smaller print nozzle at 0.4 millimeters. Once the prints have started, the most visible difference is the Axie tool head it has a window cut out in the blower shroud to allow for easier visibility of the print in progress, as well as an LED light under the print head so you can visibly see the part much easier since it's covered and lit while printing, as you'll see in the videos. Also for those who get annoyed by sounds, the Axie movements are much quieter than the workhorse due to a 32-bit controller on board instead of the 8-bit controller on board on the workhorse. Albeit, if you have a lot of printers running here in the robot sounds, as I like to call them, become somewhat soothing. You also learn their language of sorts. I'm not kidding. Over time, you will literally learn that they are yelling at you and telling you there's something wrong with them. So while hearing them may be a complete pain for most users that only have a few printers or it's in their house, those printers, those who are printing a lot, sometimes have an advantage of actually hearing the printers. Now on the sample print comparisons. When comparing 3D printers, you have to look at the quality of the resolution of the prints that result. So I'm going to take you through each of the prints I ran and share the comparisons with you. I ran multiple tests on each of these to ensure repeatability and that there were not any abnormalities. All of the tests were sliced in the slicer provided by each company. Not my recommended slicer for experts, but I used the Sindaver Simple Slicer and the, for the Axie and the Cura Lulzbot Edition LE for the workhorse utilizing the same general settings to keep it unbiased. I provided the license information for the models I used and included it in the posting for this video. I'm also going to include the original STL file for each. With that said, we're going to be printing the following today. The Benchy, the Mobius Strip, Pillars, Dead Tree, and the Squid Attack. Let's dive deeper into each of these prints and the findings of each. Since they not only take different size filaments, I was sure to buy the same brand spec filaments with the only difference being the diameter. I oftentimes choose IC3D for my high-end printing work, so it's no different in these comparison models. I typically print in ABS, which takes a lot of getting used to and isn't recommended for beginners. So for that reason, for these comparisons, I'm going to be showcasing a mix of both PLA and PETG, which are a lot more common for general users. All parts were printed in both PLA and PETG with the gray being the PLA and the blue being the PETG in this video for reference. Quick note, when using highly hygroscopic materials such as PLA, be sure to store it in a humidity controlled environment such as a dehumidifier or a bag with dry desk in it. First onto the Benchy. I use this print since it's probably the most widely accepted industry comparison for showing several different print capabilities. Both printers finish this print with a similar outcome and quality both showing that it can handle overhangs and smaller geometries. Earlier I talked about printing times and this is a good comparison for this one. The workhorse took about an hour and 45 minutes to complete this model, while the Axie took two hours and 10 minutes to complete the same sliced model. 
about a 19% slower rate due to the 20% smaller nozzle size. But speed isn't the only variable when printing, obviously. Next on the Mobius strip. In an attempt to see what kind of accuracy each printer could achieve with the more complex geometries and overhangs, I ran these at an increased speed, but otherwise standard profiles from each printer again. Both printers completed this print, but you can see how the resolution and clarity of the Axi print is a little bit higher quality throughout the print. Although the workhorse took an hour and 18 minutes to complete the print, and the Axi took an hour and 38 minutes, approximately, as expected, about 20% slower, with essentially the same exact print settings due to the 20% smaller nozzle. Often when you get this point and overhangs and have dialed in all other features with the profile, it comes down to the properties of the material and while using higher or lower temps, cooling, and speeds to obtain the goals you set for overhangs. Next on to dead tree. I scaled this model down to 50% smaller than the original size to get a more detailed comparison and also shorter print time since it's a larger model and the day is going by quickly. I then printed with higher detailed settings for both printers to showcase the capabilities to achieve the small print features and to maintain the intricate detailed settings. Both printers were able to complete this print, however, there are obvious quality differences in the features and details. The Axi print has all of the modeling in supports as well as clarity through the branches and some amazing detail in the base and the trunk from the mushrooms, fungi, and the wrapping bark pieces. The workhorse print is missing some of the modeling and supports and does not have all of the branches completed. There's also a notable difference between the Axi and the workhorse's detail, with much higher detail in Axi and lack of detail in the workhorse print. Next on to pillars. The pillars model was also sliced in the standard profiles for each printer and for this I used PLA filament. I ran these in three different sizes to examine the feature size, range, and capabilities. Each of the sizes have a specific diameter variance, giving an exact idea of how fine the feature capabilities can be printed. On the largest size setting that I did, which was 200% scale, both printers were able to complete all of the pillars with a comparable finish quality. For the medium size, however, which was 150% scale, the Axi was able to complete all pillars with a little change in quality from the large. The workhorse, however, had a slightly harder time while it did start all of these pillars. It was unable to complete them without significantly having issues visible in the Z-axis. On the smallest size, which was 100% scale, 0 0.4, 0 0.5, 0 0.6, 0 0.7, 0 0.8, 0 0.9, and one millimeter, the Axi completed all but the smallest diameter pillar, smaller than their nozzle diameter, with a similar quality as the large two. The workhorse, however, missed the, small, the two smallest diameter pillars, also smaller than the nozzle diameter, and had similar issues in the Z-axis compared to the medium size for this printer. Next, I did Squid Attack. I selected this model to showcase how each printer handles printing supports and detail, as well as the longer print times. It was such a long print that I did scale it down a bit from the original so we weren't printing all night, but it still shows the necessary details. Both printers were able to complete the print with the slicer generated supports, although the supports are a little cleaner and easier to remove from the Axi print. The Axi print also shows a visible difference in the definition of the detail and overall aesthetics of the print. The workhorse, however, seemed to have some difficulty in completing some of the finer overhang areas through the tentacles and would probably need supports to do something successfully, meaning more print time, filament, and more to remove after the print is complete. Now we're on to post printing comparisons. Note that for each test print I performed, I allowed the printing process to complete fully and let the bed move forward in the print position, which shows it's complete. The process is similar for both printers and occurs once the bed has reached the set temperatures for safety and cooling. Here are some things that I observed throughout each of these for the printing processes. First, the part removal was notably different between the two printers. The Axi has the removable flex bed that makes removing parts almost as simple as it can be by flex just flexing the plate. The workhorse on the other hand requires a putty scraper or clam knife to remove most prints, requiring scraping or popping off the rigid bed. Pro tip, use an icing cake scraper. You may have to find one with a sharp front or grind the top angle yourself. However, be forewarned, when using any part tool to take off something that is stuck and then suddenly comes, becomes free, 
I can't count the number of times that I've cut myself, so please take extreme caution when using tools on the printers. Not to mention, stay away from all moving parts that are hot. No one wants to get burned either. Another general note is that since I have many settings dialed in and I'm very used to both printers, I did not have any starting bed adhesion or material problems. However, please expect that when you first start printing, until you get your settings dialed in, your Z offsets calibrated and so forth, which you'll get there, but it may take some trial and error. That's why practice makes perfect and hence why MRG Labs exists. It's worth noting that I never recommend painter's tape or glue stick on any of my printers here in the lab. If you're starting out not enjoying it because you simply can't get a successful print, then by all means maybe try that, but by far you'll get much better of a 3D printer experience if you can take the time to learn your machines and learn all of the settings that you can control. If you can get it all dialed in, and you simply shouldn't need either of those. However, I, I know it can be frustrating initially. Reach out to your local experts though and get some lessons, or if you're in Tampa, MRG Labs is here to help you become proficient. There may even be opportunities for a lab to assist you remotely, so always feel free to inquire. As mentioned earlier, the Axie has the filament runout sensor. My rolls were full enough that we didn't have to showcase that today, but had the roll become low, the printer would have paused the print, raised the print head up so the hot surface isn't sitting on the part. However, there are pros and cons to this. If you're new to this, it could be a wonderful feature, or if you're running 50 printers and can't be watching them all at the same time, this allows you to reload the filament if caught fairly quick and resume the print. However, if you take too long though, resuming the print may have issues with adhesion between the part layers anyways because of the thermal material properties that these printers are based on. However, with the workhorse, it doesn't have this filament run out feature, so you have to make sure that you're watching it if your filament is getting low. Another pro tip for any FDM printer is once you get used to the flow rates, I highly recommend setting a timer on your phone or whatever device you may have around because inevitably you'll end up doing something else and you'll miss it. I've done this so many times on my TAS printers, unfortunately, and I personally don't recommend this because the filament will keep getting pushed out until it can't be pushed out anymore and the filament will end up getting ground onto the top of the print head causing the dust just to go everywhere in the mechanical parts of the print head. Similarly, the material isn't moving anymore but staying heated, which I personally don't recommend and believe it causes clogged nozzles over time, kind of like leaving something in your oven for too long on low. It might not be too bad, but it definitely isn't a good situation. When this happens, the print head keeps moving, so you'll get, so you'll 99% of the time not be able to recover your print. Albeit once in a blue moon, and if you get lucky enough and you pause it right when it runs out, you may still be able to recover. So both prints, you may be able to recover them both. It'll just be a little bit easier on the Axie, and you have the potential for restarting it if you catch it somewhat quickly. Lastly, in closing. Both printers are capable printers that will get the job done. However, I clearly have to say that Sendiver Axie is in many ways much better printer and provides a much greater value in comparing features, performance, and price. Sendiver has included the right features in Axie and has certainly addressed many of the shortcomings that you might find in the workhorse. Ultimately though, you might, in order to get a successful print or the detail you want, it did take a little longer to print on Axie due to the nozzle diameter being 20% smaller and the bed heating time. However, ultimately the prints will be more likely to successfully finish and will be in slightly higher resolution. Although, with more features, there's more potential for more things to break. However, if you have any issues, you have an extra two years of warranty on the Axie. If speed is of great concern to you as well, you could always switch the nozzle up a size as well, but you will sacrifice some of the quality and resolution. Same goes depending on how you slice it. The Axie is capable of printing rather quick, so you could increase the speeds to counteract it as well. Overall though, both printers are incredible and produce some great prints. We just wanted to provide some unbiased review in this video with pictures and data so you could draw your own conclusions of what would work best for your needs. Overall, the ruggedness and quality of the printer is clearly demonstrated from these side-by-side -side comparisons. It is worth noting that Sendaver has just released their newest Axie, which is the Axie 2. It adds on Wi-Fi so you can control and monitor it remotely and also added LED lights under the top rails to illuminate the print bed more than just where the print head is. 
So if you're monitoring remotely with your cameras, you can see the rest of the bed better as well. Lulzbot, however, can't be far behind on their heels though to release a new model and I'm excited to see what is soon to come out. Okay, printing nerds, it's been a long day. Hope you enjoyed the videos and please consider following us on all of your channels. Being a 51C3, we rely on donations to continue our good work. So please also consider donations to our cause. MRG Labs out.